Welcome to Conspiracy Playtime Podcast. Some people actually believe that the world is run by shape-shifting alien reptiles. No fucking way. I think just the whole podcast is rated R. Will, will there be pity? What the fuck is a conspiracy theory? When two separate events occur simultaneously pertaining to the same object of inquiry, you must always pay strict attention. The only Jewish conspiracy there is is that I'm circumcised. There's this guy from the CIA and he's creeping around Laurel Canyon. So anyone at any given time could be infected, don't even know it, and feel perfectly well. That's really the nature of science. Come on, man. That's like saying you, before you got in this program, you take a test where you're taking cocaine or not. What do you think, huh? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. We need to get the fuck out of here! Fixing that testing regime, we need to have that in place before we move to that next phase. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad! You've got to say, I'm a human being! God damn it! My life has value! I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. I strongly believe that. I do as well. And I'm all out of bubble. The FBI killed Martin Luther King. And it's fucking making sense to me now. How many vaccines have you had? Have you been a good little Nazi? Hey, a Nazi! Hey, a Nazi! If our own government was responsible for the deaths of almost 100,000 people, would you really want to know? Uh, yeah. Uh, Roll up your sleeves, take your shot, wear your mask, and please stay safe out there. Welcome to the Conspiracy Playtime Podcast, the place where we play with ideas that might get you and me canceled, ostracized on social media, uh, blacklisted, CIA, CIA rated. So set aside your preconceived notions of anything you thought and just listen to the Playtime podcast where we will continue playing with the Port Arthur Massacre. And I'm going to hand it over to Colby to take the reins on this one. Thank you, man. How was camping, by the way? I never asked you that. Oh, it was so nice to get away from everything for a while, go up into the woods where I didn't have cell service. We're yeah. sitting at August 15th, and how long were you up there? We were only like, stayed there like three or four nights. That's longer than most people go camping these days. Yeah. Not so much the weekend warrior type trip anyway. Yeah, no, it was nice to actually get up there during the week. It was still somewhat busy up in the Olympic National Park, but uh, you could tell that the weekend crowd came on Saturday when we were leaving, or Friday night they came. They're definitely more like there for the party for the weekend. And uh, it was just nice to not turn the phone off, didn't have service. Could just kind of, you know, enjoy nature and go hike in the rainforest and kind of forget about all the, the worries of the world. I think I texted you like two or three times, probably while you were in there. And then I finally asked if, if the spooks got to you. And then I started putting ads on the internet for a new co-host and then he texted me back finally so luckily Dexter's not going to have to sit in the chair anytime soon and uh, anyway I just thought it was rude that I didn't ask you about camping oh that's okay so if you haven't watched part one of the Port Arthur Massacre we kind of go in detail Colby went deep on the whole leading up to and the actual event itself 
Yeah, and if you haven't listened to it already, it's more um, along the true crime vein, I would say, more so than the stuff we're going to be getting into on this part two edition. This is the episode where we play with some ideas, huh? Yeah, and I'm already kind of forgetting who the National Review, the Australian National Review is. On their website, they claim to be propaganda-free news oh, yeah. outlet. Look at that. They say stop watching the fake news on the right side. If you scroll down a little bit more, it showed uh, right there. Stop watching fake mainstream media news. Bitcoin 2.0. Yeah, they're really big on Bitcoin, huh? It's all about silver, guys. Come on. Come on, man. Okay. It's all about food and bullets. What are you talking about? Speaking of bullets. <laughs> you can make bullets out of silver. That's true. For werewolves especially. Yeah. Episode 212, we'll get into that. Okay, so enough rambles. Yeah, let's get into it. Fucking fly. I think when Dexter comes inside, those flies are just hovering around his goddamn dog door and they just follow him. Probably. Like, he looks like pig pen from Peanuts. This uh, National Review newspaper of Australia, and like I said, I, I did a slight bit of digging into them last night, and they don't really have a bunch of people calling them out for being alt-right, leaning <laughs> as a paper uh, reporting on this kind of stuff in our country most likely would. I don't remember exactly what caught my attention about this Port Arthur massacre. Mainly, I had always been fascinated by the rapid turnaround from the day this happened into the overall attitude and compliance of the Australian people. In well, regards to their handi- Handing them over. In this episode later on, we're going to show what happens during a an event, a mass event such as the Covey one nine <coughs> in a co- <laughs> in a country that doesn't have heavily armed population, and I should start by the way by saying I I came into this thinking that they were just completely disarmed, you know, more like Great Britain kind of thing. Right, but they still have some. They have a. Special permits for farmers or woodsmen. Let's just actually, we'll come back to this article here in a second, but this topic that we just kind of rolled on to is covered better in this video than I could say it. Anti-gun activists in the U.S. have been pushing for gun law reform. Australia, having made substantial changes to its gun laws, is often held as an example. The country has a very low rate of gun-related homicide when compared to the U.S., where people are at least 20 times more likely... I just want to pause it right now. And I'm going to pull some stats out of my ass. Hopefully they're at least somewhere in the ballpark of being right, but... If I... If my memory serves me, Australia is the same mass as the uh, United States. Yeah, but the population is really small. The population is about the same as Los Angeles County. So... You can't really compare. Well, you can. For 100,000 people. You can compare, but it's such a different... Just the coverage of, you know... Yeah. I don't... And how many cities are there like Chicago and L.A. and... Yeah, you take these ghettos where it's just basically shitty policy and police reform, such as D.C. and Chicago, and more of as of late as uh, Portland. Yeah. But I just, yeah, it's kind of disingenuous to just put this up there without addressing the two differences between the countries and the demographics and the, the spread of people. Anyway. Likely to be murdered by firearms. Stricter gun controls can't stop every mass shooting, but they have made Australia a significantly safer place. Here's how. Australia used to have a serious problem with gun violence. Researchers define mass shootings as five or more deaths, not including the perpetrator. 
From 1979 to 1996, there were 13 mass shootings, resulting in over 100 deaths and more than 50 injuries. However, due to the gun lobby and politicians sympathetic to their firearm-owning voters, little was done to stop gun deaths. Being a politician and living in that bloody house is the most important thing to them. And they're not worth it. It's like the Australian version of that chick that when Hillary lost the election was like, No! I need to grease this chair up. It's a little squeaky. Uh, yeah, or just stop fucking moving. I need to learn to hold still like you do. <laughs> In April 1996, that all changed. On the island of Tasmania, the worst massacre in Australian history is finally over. At least 34 people were killed and four others critically wounded. Armed with two rifles, an AR-15 and a 308 FN, Martin Bryant made his way through Port Arthur historic site, killing 35 people and injuring a further 23. Both guns were semi-automatic, rapid-fire weapons, and both were legal in the state of Tasmania. At the time, the Port Arthur massacre was the worst single-person mass shooting in global history. It utterly shocked Australians and reignited public outrage. Just 12 days later, the then Prime Minister John Howard pushed through a sweeping set of gun regulations despite a lack of support from his rural constituency. I'm sorry about that, but there is no other way. There is no other way. Within a month, the government passed the National Firearms Agreement, transforming gun legislation in the country. Before the Port Arthur massacre, gun laws varied from state to state. What the agreement did was standardise the laws nationally. Certain semi-automatics and self-loading rifles and shotguns were banned. New licensing requirements were adopted and a national firearms registry was established. The law says Australians need a genuine reason for having a firearm, <laughs> such as sports shooting or for agricultural use. It doesn't include self-defence. Self-defense is not a genuine reason to have a gun if you're in Australia. That's legislated. Interesting. People must go through background checks and wait 28 days before they can buy a gun. The government also spent 375 million US dollars to buy back 640,000 civilian-owned guns and then destroy them. Tax. After the gun law reform, the total number of homicides involving a hmm? firearm decreased by That was by paid half. for by the tax. The total number right. of gun-related deaths fell rapidly as well, dropping more than half in 2016 compared with 1996. Australia didn't see a single mass shooting from 1996 to like 2018 how they just the low more than point. 22 years. However, well, anti-gun activists warned about gun that violence, following years of lobbying by pro-gun groups, Australia's strict gun kick. laws have been eroded, or I think and knife? gun numbers are almost back to the same uh, level as that's the not time knife. of the Port Arthur massacre. In May 2018, a lot of stabbings in Australia, seven, probably. I think four there children, is. knife deaths went up 8,000 percent. In, suicide in the state of Western Australia, it's brought back painful memories and uncertainty about the issue many thought had been resolved. Australia is not totally immune to mass shootings but its response to the Port Arthur massacre demonstrated how strong political leadership and strict gun control policies can help curb violence and save lives. It's crazy that they destroyed all those guns versus, uh, I don't know, maybe selling them or like parting them out. I would have taken one or two of them. <laughs> hey, look, Dingleberry fucks dick. Well, and look at the, right above that, John Oliver on Australia. And yeah, I actually watched this probably when it first came out back when i used to like him yeah i can't fucking stomach anything he does now okay so as we see it this that bloomberg video kind of just laid out the corporate narrative of the transformation meant reason now to buy a gun versus and all because of this massacre Let's go back to this article now. The Nash the Australian National Review. So there's various lists of inconsistencies and discrepancies, but I wanted to start out by saying what little bit I have retained throughout the last couple of weeks. They had this twenty nine year old kid and I call him a kid because I'm old as fuck. That's actually older than you are, Jeremiah, but Look at him and look at how he acts. Yeah. And they have stated many times that 
he yeah, has the, the IQ yeah. of an 11 year old. There's that number again. So I, I just kind of think of him as a kid. And when you watch the, the uh, police interrogation videos, which we'll put a little bit of that in here, he's not taking it seriously. He's having fun. He thinks this is a game. And the police, knowing that he is mentally disabled to the point of not being able to withstand trial, they really tried to break him down and get him to confess. And he, there's parts of the interview where he's like, how many people were shot? <laughs> and then they're like, you did it, didn't you? No, I didn't do it. And then... At one point, they get him to confess. And if you don't remember this from part one, I will refresh the memory. There was a point during the shooting where he runs and then he goes from his car to another car, shoots the wife, puts the husband in the trunk. He admits to kidnapping that guy to the cops. He says, they say, how did you do it? And he said, I, I waved the gun at him. And then he got in the trunk. He didn't say anything about shooting the woman. But for some reason, he admits to doing that. And I, I mean, you know, my wheels start turning at that point, And I think back to Lee Harvey Oswald being a patsy. Actually probably involved somehow in the conspiracy to take down JFK, whether he knew the extent of it or not. It's almost like Martin Bryant was definitely there and definitely a part of what was going on. And for some reason, he didn't have an issue admitting to the police that he kidnapped that man. It's just kind of odd. So this lawyer comes in, a guy named John Avery. And I can't find it in a lot of sources, but apparently he had a lawyer already. This lawyer was going to go with a not guilty plea. And they then gave him a court-appointed lawyer, John Avery. And this guy's just a piece of work. He basically strong arms Martin into pleading guilty. He's got all these stories about how he wanted to plead guilty to the murders but not guilty to the attempted murder so he could make a spectacle out of the, you know, make a kangaroo court. Wow, that finally works. But he didn't end up letting Martin plead not guilty to any of it so and what he said was i just think that it would be tragic for the people who already had to live through that experience to come actually testify so it would just be that the outcome was always going to be the same so i just figured it was it would be better if they didn't have to relive that that was his excuse now i'm not familiar with the australian court system enough to speak freely on this, but in my mind, a defense attorney's fucking job is to do what the client wants, whether he went in there and shot all those people or not. Right. If he wants to plead not guilty, that's his decision, especially, yeah. and he's, we're talking about a guy who's, I'm going to say it again, he's mentally disabled. Yeah, There's a point where this lawyer, John Avery, comes out with a drawing that Martin supposedly drew in great detail. It's a bunch of stick figures. It looks like a little kid drew it. But the precision of it, it, just how the shooting happened, exactly. That was enough. When the lawyer hands that over to the courts and to the police, they, they got him to plead guilty, and then there was no trial where evidence was presented, and there wasn't any. The evidence that they have is... A blonde man walks in, starts shooting from the hip, and the witness from testimony. The videotape. Yeah, there's there's footage that people got on their camcorders over by the where the buses were parked. It was described by witnesses that he didn't have gloves on and that he took a drink and set his bag down. They didn't lift any fingerprints from the entire scene because they didn't have to. They had the guilty plea. This man-child, Martin Bryant, didn't see his day in court. and Which you are all, everyone is, you're entitled to. I mean, like I said, we are here. Yeah. And it kind of seems like they have a similar system because the, the uh, lawyer, John Avery, keeps just kind of tiptoeing around the fact that 
we need to get him to plead guilty so there's not some kind of spectacle in court and all these victims don't have to relive the, the trauma, which, you know what, if they don't go to court, it's not like they're ever going to think about this again. Right. Okay, so we're going to get into some inconsistencies that took place. Oh, by the way, this motherfucker was given 35 life sentences. That's right. Home the one, for one for every death, and that's over a 1,000 years when you add it up. And Wow. Just to drive the point home, right? Right. Here's some of the questions. And if you notice, we're at February 15th of 2021 that this was written. So just this earlier this year. Because apparently conspiracies over Port Arthur Massacre are making a comeback. Would it hurt to reopen the investigations to ensure Australians were not misled about this tragedy? Where the fuck is the question mark? Come on, man. This is uh, something I was going to talk about in the first episode. Barry Unsworth was a premier of New South Wales. And Barry Unsworth is quoted as saying, there would never be uniform gun laws until there had been a massacre in Tasmania. Apparently, he was living there when he said it, so it's not just some random thing. And plus what? Did they have some master plan that they'd be cooking up for nine years? It's just one of those things that does catch people's eyes. Yeah. So that is the first thing. They, Malcolm R. Hughes from the Australian National Review brings up. How did Barry Unsworth come to make the prediction in December of 87 that there would never be uniform gun laws until there had been a massacre in Tasmania? Why Tasmania? Why did Ray Groom sacrifice a ministerial position in federal parliament to take up a Tasmanian parliamentary career about the time of the above statement by Unsworth? So apparently some guy took a... Kind of a smaller position. A demotion, I guess. Yeah. Some of these are just... You would have to look into each one of them. Wait, wait. What? This Tasmanian government bought... The Broad Arrow Cafe? This is something I found out last night that I didn't come across until this article, but apparently they bought it. This and you cafe. have to wonder, because this is like a historical site, so maybe it's kind of like, you know how here in America we have stuff like uh, the National Forest Service or, uh, you know, these like national BLM parks. before it was BLM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have all of these federal agencies that own land that own uh campgrounds stores and they are run by the federal government federal government pays employees there um national forest service uh so maybe it's something like that where it's this historical site and they've deemed this cafe historic but it is still very interesting that it happens on federal land Mm -hmm. i mean if you were going to pick a place when you pick your plane filled. Yeah. So if you take a look at the picture of this truck, this is the one that kept coming up in all these different conspiracy podcasts I was listening to. Um, why did the Tasmanian government ask a Hobart funeral business to tender for a 22 birth freezer mortuary truck in the 12 months before the massacre when no other state had such a vehicle? And then promptly after it was sold. Or there was an attempt to sell. I think they did end up selling it. Maybe they weren't able to, but they wanted to get rid of it. And this same Victorian company that did the truck was asked, looks like, to make a bunch of excess mortuary boxes as well. Was that just an Australian way of saying coffin? Must be. <laughs> mortuary box. It's a mortuary box, mate. I apologize to our Australian listeners. I know there's at least one. <clears throat> I won't try to do the accent. Good day, mate. I can't help myself. I know it's horrible, but it's fun. How is it that the Tasmanian police commissioner, Richard McCready, had Martin Brandt's file before the gunman had it been identified as Martin Brandt? And mm. that that is something that kept coming up also. It's almost like one of those things that how could you ever really know? Yeah. Could be interesting to look into this one a little bit maybe more. Because maybe did this commissioner have that file because of the strange death of that? Oh, the woman in the car? Yeah. Could be, and he was also kind of known about 
around those parts because it neighbors and stuff all you'd, you'd like point guns at them and shit yeah but then again getting back into the tinfoil hat realm what, what kind of person would you pick if you needed a patsy yeah somebody that had maybe killed somebody just fucking around in the car and had also been known to brandish firearms and walk around at weird hours of the night whether i believe or not martin brand did it i definitely think he was there but we'll get into how he couldn't have been in two places at once so here's some broad arrow cafe inconsistencies where were there possibly as many as 30 intelligence agents present at Port Arthur that weekend? And we already talked about how there were no fucking cops there. The only cops that were on duty there were off chasing a claim that there was powdered drugs found. Oh, Ended up being right. like baby powder or something. Yeah. Why were seven of those intelligence agents killed that day? Two shot in the broad arrow and five at the scene where he switched his cars out. As the gunman was never reported as wearing gloves, this is the one we mentioned briefly, why did the police never recover DNA or fingerprints from his eating tray, utensils, drink container, rifles, or magazines said to have been mm. used? Why did the police leave the window down of the ab abandoned Volvo overnight, causing dew to dissipate fingerprints from the steering wheel? Does that happen? I don't know. Uh, I guess that would make sense. I mean... Yeah, or, or they could just use that bullshit excuse, even if it didn't. True. We should do that. I don't have I any fingerprint fingers. readers, but you can't, you can't fucking buy those at Rite Aid, probably. Can't you just take some tape and... Oh, they do that in the movies. Surely it's got to be real if Mockingbird has told us so. I just watched fucking... I don't even know what I was going to say. Uh, Miami have CIA, a, NCIA or whatever. I haven't watched... NCS oh. or... <laughs> I have not watched a movie in so long or shows. I'm sitting here paying for Hulu, HBO, <laughs> leeching on my brother's Netflix account, leeching on my sister's Amazon Prime account. Too busy with this. And it's just, it's like we, we, you've referenced a few times they live. It's like we're putting on the glasses, man. And I'm sorry. I don't miss the fucking entertainment that you can see what it clearly is these days. But No, I mean, it's kind of, it gets annoying after a while. Why did the gunman need to take the BMW to Seascape when he already had transport via the Volvo? If I remember correctly, in the step-by-step -step analysis I kind of read and threw together, it seemed like those two people that tried to turn around at the toll blocked him. And I, I think that's why he had to get out of his car. Yeah. Why did the gunman need to take Glenn Pears? Okay, so that was the name of the gentleman who he threw in the trunk. Glenn Parrish, huh? Why did he need to? I mean, why does anybody ever need to take a hostage? And who was Glenn Parrish? He's the guy that he threw in the trunk. Right, oh, do you mean who was he? Yeah. Just some unlucky fuck because he ended up dying. I remember this one, and some people can just look into things a little too much. Why did the Victorian bank manager, remember? Oh, yeah. He stands up and he's in shock and he says, no, not here, not here. Does that mean, like, why is this happening here? Or, like, dude, you're supposed to be on the shooting at that boat with all those American tourists at it. <sighs> Do you remember how he kept shooting across the bay? Yeah. But wasn't it not a... Was well, it across the bay? Or he, what? I thought it was it was, it was like a field or something. Well, he kept, the he kept shooting at different things, but he, it was, like, three, four, possibly five times. Kind of lost count. He shoots at the... It's, I think it's like the prison thing across the bay where there's tourism going on. Hmm. He just keeps randomly shooting at it. Because one of the theories was that he was supposed to do this, or he, whoever, was supposed to do this, but the ferry was late, or, or I think the ferry, ferry was late. Yeah. Because remember, he checked in and, yeah. and then went and decided to shoot everybody in the restaurant instead, I guess. Because he did ask when he pulled into the broad arrow parking lot he asked the guy that was guiding parking if uh the ferry had left yet why were these witness statements okay why did the victoria it is interesting that the guy who said that was a, vic a bank, bank manager though you know that just like feeds the conspiracy trolls. bank managers and intelligence agents getting whacked inside there 
Why wasn't Roger Larner's witness statement in which he shows that Martin Bryant could not have been at Port Arthur at the time of the shootings began taken into account? Well, oh, because that's the guy who he stopped and visited, right? And he asked about his wife or something? Yeah, because he kind of had the hots for her. Yeah, that is who it was. So apparently his testimony or his statement poses a contradiction in the official narrative. Why were these witness statements or any other favorable to Bryant not shown to the judge? There's other ones where I think it was a woman who ended up getting away unscathed. She describes him as having freckles on his face, and then there was another person who said pockmarks, but he's got Barbie doll smooth skin. I mean, he's, he's kind of a hunk. So the fact that two people gave statements of him having markings on his face, mm-hmm. some sort of other. Well, how did police commissioner Fielding purport to know there were no live hostages in Seascape on Monday morning if he didn't have radio contact with the people inside Seascape? Because it wasn't part of the plan, man. But, you know, that reminds me of uh, when uh, when the fire happened here and we tried to go into our uh, RV park because we knew that it hadn't burned down because I think we'd gone by on the freeway or something. Well, my mom had driven into the park and seen that everything was untouched there early in the morning. But by the time we got back, the police had already set up barricades. And I don't know what police officer it was. It was a Medford PD. Uh, it was some sort of officer who seemed higher up. I don't know you know, if he was the chief or whatnot. But I told him that we needed to go to our home in the RV park, in the holiday RV park. He was like, there's nothing left of it. It's all gone. I think he was just like... That was his loaded statement to everyone. Yeah, and he was probably... I mean, he looked like he was tired of dealing with trying to tell people not to go into Fuck the Fuck it, I'll just tell them all their shit's gone. Yeah. They'll leave me alone. So I could see how a police chief under pressure... Maybe the reports that he was getting made it sound like, oh my God, this guy's shooting everybody. So therefore, there is nobody alive still. But it's hard to say. I like it, man. You're taking the skeptic route. Well, you know, got to kind of play both sides, right? Oh, for sure. The thing with the mom... Carlene was his mom. Mm -hmm. Why was Carlene Bryant, who was escorted to police headquarters by police, not asked to identify the telephone caller's voice from Seascape as her son, Martin? Is that normal? Well... Like has been said, even when we go up a few talking about how the police chief or commissioner dude or whatever his title was had the file on hand before they knew who was doing it. They knew to go get her. They just knew it was him at this point. So I don't know. How'd they know it was him? How'd they know it was him so early? That's the whole like, f- that's the thing with the file and the <clears throat> thing right here because they went and got I mean remember, when did they get her? Remember what they claimed? Is that he was making all these phone calls to the cop's wife and shit? Oh yeah. That part never added up to me at all. Be- because I think that's how they explained that they knew who this fucking guy was. Because and he he's an eleven year old intelligence level. Yeah, and he, IQ sixty six, and this is before cell phones. He IQ just has sixty six, like just that's six, dumber six. than Forrest Gump. Six six. <laughs> Why did they pick this guy? Have you decoded Gamatria? Uh, I think in the last one? episode, I had grabbed some stuff that Zach Hubbard had done. Zach Hubbard's decoded this a few times. Man, I bet there's all sorts of numbers in there. Oh yeah. Yes, there's some weird discrepancies regarding how they had identified him because his, you know, he'd left his girlfriend in the morning, went and talked to that fella who kind of wanted to keep him away from his wife. Then the shooting, this all happened so fast. And man, I probably should have just watched <laughs> episode one la- or part one of this last night just to kind of give myself a refresher about all what I went over. 
It's like when you study and cram for a college exam and then you just get it over with and then you just dump it out of your brain. Yeah. That's what it feels like when we research these episodes, to me anyway. Totally. Um, why did Sergeant Dutton make false statements about the weapons supposedly used? Yeah, Dutton, why? Why did Sergeant Dutton have a questioner threatened with arrest and escorted from Port Arthur Massacre meeting held in Queensland? Okay, we're going to get in some weird... Let's take a break from this list for now. I saw this video last night for the first time. I did a little bit more digging into some of these uh, witness testimonies. We're going to go to a dude who... got His wife was killed in the cafe. And he gets a letter from the coroner regarding the events. You might find this interesting. My wife Elizabeth and I were both employees at Port Arthur Historic Site Management Authority and were both working there the day of the massacre. My wife Elizabeth was murdered inside the gift shop section of the Broad Arrow Cafe, one of 20 victims murdered thereabouts. I know that Martin Bryant was not the gunman at the massacre at Port, Port Arthur. How do I know? The coroner, Mr Ian Matheson, wrote a letter to a number of survivors of the massacre informing us that Martin Bryant was not the gunman at Port Arthur. In the letter dated the 31st of January 1997, the coroner, Mr Matheson, wrote, As a result of the outcome of the charges against Martin Bryant in the Supreme Court of Tasmania, I write to advise I do not intend to resume the inquest that I opened on the 29th of April 1996. I believe it is not in the interests of the family friends or witnesses to again traverse the factual situation in a public hearing, particularly when any finding I make must not be inconsistent with the decision of the Supreme Court. Well, I thought long and hard about this statement and discussed the point with friends. You must understand that there were many other facts of the shootings inside the Broad Arrow Cafe that begged a proper open investigation including workplace safety issues and especially the issue of the emergency exit that were totally outside the issues of the gunman. Remember how that was locked? It was the simple fact that the coroner, Mr. That Ian Matheson, government believed that, that he government. could not make any finding that was inconsistent with the findings of the Hobart Supreme Court. That really stirred me. The Supreme Court can only make the finding of either guilty or not guilty in the matter brought before it. It follows that for Mr Ian Matheson's inquest into the massacre at Port Arthur to make a finding inconsistent with the Hobart Supreme Court, then the finding could have only been Martin Bryant was not guilty of the charges brought before him. For the coroner, Mr Ian Matheson, to arrive at the decision not to resume the inquest into the death of the 35 people that were murdered at Port Arthur, the massacre due to this reason, which he himself provided, and the coroner must have been aware that Martin Bryant was not guilty of the serious offences which produced 72 charges against police brought against him that day. Okay, good. That other one was really fucking blurry. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we can read this one. I can't understand that motherfucker. <laughs> Pause it for a second. What do you think of that? That is interesting. I don't understand. How would the coroner know? He saw inconsistencies, apparently, because... Maybe with what bullets are in the bodies or, like, what wounds they have or... All he says is, any finding I make must not be inconsistent with the decision of the Supreme Court, so I'm just going to not do it. And Yeah, he can't do it. He can't make any legal case because the case has been closed. Case shut. Done. Game over. So let's step back a few. No, absolutely zero forensic proof that Martin Bryant was the shooter. Right, because there's no fingerprints brought in the... No DNA swab. I mean, surely he had to have sweat or freaking spit on his gun or, you know... 
Open and shut case, you would think. Fuck, I forgot about this, dude. This will make your blood boil. Remember how I was talking about this guy's a piece of shit? Yeah. They basically blackmail a gun owner who they had some fucking stuff on. I don't want to read this. Yeah. So this is a letter of intimidation that somebody... So this is a letter written to a gun shop owner from John Avery. Dear Sir, we write to confirm that we attended with you at police headquarters this morning when a discussion was had with Inspector Ross Payne and other police officers. We made it clear... What the fuck does... So those... That's a two? Oh, yeah. okay. We made it... We made it clear to those police officers what your position was, namely that at no time had you sold any guns to Bryant, but that you had some ammun but that you had sold ammunition to him, but as each occasion he had shown to you a gun license, which of course enabled you to sell not only ammunition to him but guns as well. In a pri- man in a private conversation that was had between the writer and Inspector Payne... Is my eyesight going? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or maybe it's to the officer and Inspector. To the writer? In a private conversation that was had between... Maybe the writer is like the writer of this letter. Inspector Payne made it abundantly clear that the that police have very strong evidence to suggest that you did, in fact, sell guns to Brian. And unless you are prepared to, in effect, change your story... They will press on and try to find sufficient evidence to change, charge you with some offenses. <laughs> it gets worse. However, it was also made abundantly clear that the director of public prosecutions is prepared to offer you an indemnity indemnity against prosecution if you are prepared to accept that you did sell guns to Bryant. Quite clearly, you need to very carefully consider your position over the next few days. If you indeed, if you indeed, if did indeed sell. you did sell guns to Bryant, but that at all times he showed to you a gun license. He's basically just telling him what to say. Then, of course, you will have committed no offense in any right. If, on the other hand, you did sell guns to Bryant and you were aware that he had no license, then clearly you have committed an offense. But the indemnity being offered to you would ensure that you are not prosecuted for any gun offense. Wow. This is the best part, how he signs it. I mean, look at this. This is not a fake letter. We would suggest that you give this matter your careful consideration over the ensuing weekend and contact the... Is that writer? I think so. Perhaps next Tuesday afternoon, in order that we can discuss the matter further, we have indicated to the police that we will not be able to come back to them before Wednesday or Thursday of next week, and that is acceptable to them. Yours faithfully, John Avery. Okay. So, I mean, in summation to that, they found a gun shop owner that had been doing shady dealings, they knew it, and they blackmailed him to lie and say that he sold guns to Bryant when he originally told the police he didn't. So John Avery's lawyer is doing the job of the prosecution at this point. And you know, maybe maybe this guy did sell guns illegally to, to him and he didn't want to know it. That's also it true. Over. What is the motive here, though? Oh, it's to To get frame, him to say yeah. what they want. And I'm having a hard time believing that... This guy, see, they're offering him full indemnity if he is to co- cooperate and play ball. But to me, 
if you go up to about halfway into the letter, they're saying that they have other stuff on him that has nothing to do with Martin Bryant, right. and they will use that against him. Because why would they have to bring that up if he's telling the truth? Or if he's not telling the truth? I have no idea. Because this motherfucker's lying. Well, the lawyer. John Avery, yeah. Regardless of whether this guy did sell guns to Bryant or not, they made it clear to him, I'm sure this letter's not the first time that they offered him a deal. Right, or anybody else. Because he turned it down, and so he felt compelled to put it in paper, or to put it on paper. Mm. And I mean, dude, you imagine getting a letter like this? Oh, that scared the shit out of me. Would you want to do what they told you to do? Probably. I'd feel like I would get the book thrown at me. It'd be interesting to dig into this a little bit more and see what happened with this gun owner, gun shop owner. Representing Martin Bryant, his new lawyer, John Avery. Appointed after Bryant had pleaded not guilty six weeks ago. No. No, never. I think that's a piece that they just kind of gloss over. I think they're trying to make it seem like it's weird that he's ambidextrous. Some people do things differently, though. You know, like he's I masturbate really with my left hand. <laughs> it's not that he's necessarily ambidextrous. It could just be that's more comfortable for him. Maybe he can't close that other eye. Let's take this time to talk about things that you and I had in store and maybe some changes we've made today in our planning. Our uh, big dream was to have 33 episodes come out all in a row. And at this point, you know, we're about a third of the way there, but things are moving too fast. And yeah, you and I have us. refrained from talking about current events so far. They've kind of milked into there or just kind of like, yeah, there's just a few bled into drops. it a little bit, but we're chomping at the bit, guys. We we uh, and and gals, we would love to be able to start dropping these episodes soon, so we could start covering current events and get get the stuff out. It's uh, Sunday, August fifteenth, and kind of a happy accident that poor Arthur was on the list of things to be covered early on, and that we dove into it because now. If anybody doesn't have their eye on Australia, it's a good thing to look into. And it's it's loosely connected to this because I want to make the point that what it looks like in a country that's been heavily disarmed when shit starts to hit the fan. The first video I want to pull up, I want to say it's about a year old. We could find the date on it. So we're talking late summer, Our 2020, year, September yeah. 2nd probably safe to assume this took place somewhere in the second half of August of last summer. So we're looking at pretty much a year ago. And I want to get both our reactions in here. Um, yeah, you can show you me your call? search warrant before you go no. through my so house. You're, you're, you're the, uh, yeah, I own this house. Yeah, it is. Search warrant. Search warrant for what? Now, what I will explain to you is, is if you want to listen, you've got your phone going. Yeah, I do, yeah. Right. Now, you're under arrest in relation to incitement. Incitement? Yeah. What's that? Now, you're not obliged to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given evidence. Excuse me, incitement for what? What the, what on earth? Yeah. What? Excuse me, what What on earth? Yeah, just put your phone down. Can you, like, record this? I'm in my pyjamas. What's I this? I an ultrasound in an hour. Because yeah, pregnant. she's pregnant, so... Well, I'm taking it easy. What's this about? I have an ultrasound just let me in an hour. Let me finish and I'll explain. It's in relation to a Facebook post, in relation to a lockdown protest you put on for Saturday. Yeah, and I wasn't breaking any laws by doing you that. You are actually. You are breaking all. That's why I'm arresting you. In relation to in front How of can my you children, arrest her? That's. In front of my two children. Can't you just say to her, take the post down? Like, come I mean, on. I'm happy to delete the post. This yeah. is ridiculous. Right. Yeah. But I have to give you these caution and rights. You understand? Yeah, that's fine. Not, like, I'm happy to delete to the post. This is anything? ridiculous. You like, I just said, that's maybe fine. Maybe getting the evidence. You understand that? Yeah, that's fine. But my two kids are here. I have an ultrasound in an hour. Like, I'm happy to delete the post. You also have the right to communicate with or to communicate with a legal practitioner. Do you understand those rights? Yeah, this is ridiculous. Yeah, this is a bit unfair. Come on, mate. No, we, we what about she just doesn't do the event? Like, it's not like she's done it. Well, she made a post. Already committed the offence. So, I'm not going to So, that's it. an offence. Now, search warrant. 
entitles us and we are required to seize any computers, no. any mobile devices you have. Us? Yeah, can I just what get your badge there, mate? It's all there. This is a lot of stress on her too. She's pregnant, like, come on. I'm relaxed. This is just very unfair. Move your thumb, mate. There you go. That's fine, can I just let me finish? Let me finish. Any mobile telephone you've got, okay? So what we want is any mobile telephone you've got. Yeah, and these are. It's yeah, it's her sister's phone. So. It doesn't matter. Any device in this house, we're taking. This is well, ridiculous. you're not taking my phone. Well, I'm taking any device. Mate. Any That's device. my phone. It's, I'm, it's nothing doesn't to do with her. It's my matter. phone. Wow. Fuck that. Right off that you all have passwords on your devices and that they're encrypted. <laughs> Especially or if you're least, into the fucking tentacle porn like I am. Or at least bury your hard drive or something. I don't know. Man, when I first watched that, what a calm-headed dude, the the husband. Mm -hmm. You fucking put hands on my pregnant wife. One of us is leaving that house dead. There's no qualms. Not to mention, about I want to know how they get in the house. All he, she let him in, and I probably had no fucking idea what was probably, going on yeah. because apparently, and they did say it, but she had organized a. Lockdown protest yes. on Facebook. They came to arrest her for that. And she had the wherewithal to start live streaming because they do end up taking that phone. Mm. And I'm sure they just turn it off at that point because that's where the video ends. Yeah. He got more defensive about them taking his phone than, he, than taking his wife. Well, I'm sure he like is like, well, I need to call a lawyer. Or like, you know, if, if you suddenly then have no means of communication to anybody because who remembers the phone numbers of people that they need to contact in a situation like that to where it's like that's why you have those written down somewhere by the way uh yeah I not just so. on the cloud no so that i was enraged and you know how i am i'm a little bit of a fucking anti-government stay Libertarian. the fuck out of my house yeah I've never had Facebook, and it's safe to say that I never will. It's kind of funny that we're starting a year ago in 2020, and we're, uh, we're going to now make our way up the list. This was sometime a few months later, a few months after the pregnant lady getting arrested. All I want to know is, is this chick single? Police have smashed in a car window to arrest Eve Black, a coronavirus skeptic who posted a video of herself breaching a Melbourne checkpoint. Here's a reminder of what she did. I don't need to answer your questions. No. no. Have I committed a crime? Pardon? Have I committed a crime? Have I committed a crime? Thank you. Yeah, nice. well, they caught up with her yesterday. She's now been arrested. And for more, we are joined by legal expert Justin Quill in Melbourne. Justin, thanks for your time this morning. I mean, first up, this though, guy. you are in lockdown. I assume you're doing the right thing. How do you feel about this woman's actions? Uh, look, uh, it's... it's Frustrating, I guess, is, uh, and you know, given that I'm uh, on a uh, a live television show, I'll be uh, I'll be uh, careful with my my language. But frustrating uh, is an understatement, to be to be frank. But what's he frustrated about? You think? Uh, right. That, what that, do you think? What's your guess? That not now everybody knows how to get away from this. <laughs> Everyone's trying to do the right thing. I've got my mask here. Um, we've got an exemption where uh, it's important for people to be able to hear us, so that's why I, I have the mask off for the moment while I'm doing this cross. What kind of fucking mockingbird shit do they got going on down under? He has to it's, stick to, uh, you know, I, I would be wearing this if I wasn't talking to you right now. But as soon as I've finished it, I'll be putting it back on, and 
Uh, if everyone does the right thing, you know, we will get on top of it. But when you see people flouting the laws, and especially we just heard what we heard about uh, the, the Queensland situation, um, it is uh, frustrating to say the least. Yeah, I mean, it's appalling action. I mean, that was video that was taken last week. She was so proud of herself for that. Yesterday, police caught up with her. They smashed her window when she again refused to provide any details. Plenty of people this morning saying good on them. What's she being charged with? Yeah. Yeah, and look, it's important to note that that is a, to, what happened yesterday is obviously a very separate incident to the one that we saw the video of a, a moment ago. Look, she's been charged, uh, she's been released, uh, and there's a summons on its way to her. So a little bit like the checks in the mail for her. Unfortunately for her, the uh, the uh, the summons is in the mail. It's a, a driving offences. It's failure to produce a licence with the, uh, uh, um, identifying details, and also uh, failure to uh, comply with the direct of the mm. chief medical officer. She's also not wearing um, a mask. So that's what she's, uh, she's going to be charged uh, with. She's also not wearing well, a mask. Well, we've been talking the about hell? these two teenagers in Queensland and whether or not the punishment fits the crime. In regards to what Eve Black has done here, what can she be charged with? In I mean, what can she be fined and what is the potential punishment? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an unusual situation. This is very different to normal circumstances where someone walking down the street, the police can't just stop you and ask you for for identification unless they think you have committed a crime or about to commit a crime. Uh, but we are in uh, a state of emergency at the moment. Minority That's been report. officially declared. Uh, and uh, in Victoria, for example, there's a particular act, the uh, Health and Wellbeing Act, and that uh, sets out all the provisions that uh, apply when we're under a state of emergency. And so where you don't follow the directives of the Chief Medical Officer, Brett Sutton in the case of Victoria, uh, and his delegates, so mm. Victoria Police, then you can be um, fined some pretty serious fines. Now at the moment, um, for if I was to walk down the street without a mask, uh, mm. I would be up for 10 penalty units. That's a, about $1,652. Uh, but you can be fined up to 120 penalty units. So it's nearly $20,000 if you continue to flout those, uh, those laws. So uh, the fines can get pretty serious. Um, 1,652 might not seem like um, a lot if you uh, um, if you don't what follow those directives. What a bumbling fucking incubus! But uh, they can, it can uh, uh, get ramped up if you it's continue a walking to do neck. so. Um, not wearing a mask is two hundred dollars. It's a lower fine, but mm. other things like going through checkpoints and things like that, it's the sixteen hundred and fifty-two. Well, hopefully it sends a strong message to these COVID sceptics to do the right thing and do it for all of us. Thanks for joining us this morning, Justin. And it's 7.27272. 72 has uh, some good significance there to uh, good old uh, overseers. Eve Black, who are you? It's like Alex Jones with titties. <laughs> Maybe we should ask her to get on the podcast. Fuck yes, man. She can move in. You don't have to live in Australia no more. This is a August 12th video, 2021. The COVID crackdown is about to get a lot tougher with police taking control of the state's public health orders. Hundreds more soldiers will also be on the streets along with more restrictions on travel. Kate Brown deployed National Guard to hospitals. Oh, what Just are they gonna yesterday. do? Good fucking question. They are freaking, no offense to anybody who's in part of no, the National no, but Guard. What? But yeah. You're weekend warriors. Are they medically trained? Right. Look at what's the purpose? I mean, when the National Guard was here after the fires, they're a bunch of kids. Yeah, and you know, there was stuff for them to do. But for the most part, they just stood at freaking, you know, they had their Humvees parked there and they just stood there. Yeah. This guy looks stoned as fuck. <laughs> and new rules on singles bubbles. If you thought living through... If you think Orwellian shit is in America... Buckle up, buttercup. Lockdown has been hard enough. It's likely restrictions are about to get tougher. I assume um, Police Commissioner Fuller will ask for more ADF Kate Brown support. was Australian. Finding Delta with soldiers and an army of lawyers. The state's top cop has been tasked with reviewing all COVID rules following a crisis cabinet meeting yesterday. Working with a, a team of government officials to determine what those additional measures may look like. Stripping New South Wales health of its power over public health orders, putting them in the hands of police. Following concerns, current restrictions uh, either aren't working yeah, that guy, that or being officer openly challenged. 
If there are additional measures uh, that uh, can increase uh, compliance measures, well then of course the government will accept that. The aim to close loopholes in current rules. It's expected singles bubbles will need to be formally nominated to prevent people from visiting multiple households and permits required to travel to regional areas to stop holidays or looking at real estate. The public health orders have to be created sometimes in, the, in a space of hours and there will always be the possibility that uh, there are ways through and around them. With the weather warming up, the concern is crowds like this at Bondi and Manly will become harder to police. Very different scenes to when beaches were shut last year, when daily COVID numbers were a quarter of what they are today. The Commissioner's request will be handed to Cabinet by the end of the week and given how desperate authorities are to get a handle on this current outbreak, it's likely he'll be granted everything he asks for. Andrew Denny, 7 News. Tough cup. That tough permit system could prevent people using so-called reasonable excuses to travel away from Sydney. For some, like those with holiday homes, it's legal, but they're likely to get a frosty wow. reception at their destination. Threadbow's seeing its best snow in years and it's not exactly going to waste. Sydney-based judge Chris Hoy Australia. and wife Phoebe are at the ski lodge raising questions and frustrations. Why are people still travelling? You should choose not to, shouldn't you? I don't have much time for them. I think we're all, all in it together and need to get through it. But it is perfectly legal. You can move between homes. Legal too for an infected Sydney man to go to Byron Bay on an alleged real estate junket, triggering a local lockdown. We are still seeing people who are... Guy who they thought had COVID went somewhere, so they locked down. The current health orders. Like the couple who drove six hours from Sydney to Albury, claiming they'd gone to all that effort to get vaccinated. Upon arriving, we asked for their ID and their licence has stated that they were from Sydney, so unfortunately they were turned away. But rule breakers aren't bound to the road. Two women flew from here in Sydney to Melbourne on Monday without the right permits, but it gets worse. Both women have since tested positive for COVID. Both have been fined. Fines of $5,452 each have been issued for these two individuals. A very expensive trip and New South Wales is handing out stiff fines too. In the New past South 24 Wales. hours, 407 people were served infringement notices, 176 for not wearing a mask, 56 with breaching public health orders. Even a handful of people doing the wrong thing uh, is causing major setbacks. And we don't need any more of those. Tom Hartley, 7 News. Almost 70% of Australians could be fully vaccinated by the end of October if the high take-up continues. 7 News can exclusively reveal the federal government's rollout target has changed once again, just as COVID infiltrates the nation's capital. The Canberra bubble officially... This wartime language is getting a little blatant. The fucking COVID infiltrated. This is a new mythology they're fucking weaving right before our very eyes. Bad guys. Oh, yeah. COVID and people that don't get vaccinated. Good guys. Dr. Truth Science Fucci. Fukaki yeah. Fauci. And if you think that there's already a cure called Evermectin and zinc and vitamin D, uh, then you are just a conspiracy theorist who clearly is not listening to the right doctors. I can't fucking believe you just said those three buzzwords. There's no way we're going to be able to put this up. <laughs> just kidding. Say it all. Sandy Hook. Bursts. The ACT will enter into a seven-day lockdown. One case quickly becoming four, the first in a year, sparking panic buying and a rush. Oh, to panic buying. Here we are. One case became four. I know three people that have COVID right now. Three. Thank God <laughs> we're not in Australia. Because if I know three people in our region that have COVID, how many do? Oh, I mean, apparently the hospitals are overrun. Yeah. I've been being begged to take the jab by my employers, your ex-employers. They, they, stop, they stopped talking about it, but just the other day, I was telling Jeremiah earlier, she approached me and on the behalf of her nurse friend who was just so overwhelmed, please, please consider getting vaccinated. What were you going to say? I don't think any of these hospitals are using the cure that... Love him or hate him, I don't give a shit. Donald Trump got, he got Evermectin and Tim Dillon. D and all those treatments. Tim, Tim, Tim Dillon just came down with COVID last week and he's doing the Trump treatment. And you know what's funny? That motherfucker was vaccinated. Trump or, oh, I don't know Tim about Dillon. Trump. 
Tim Dillon was vaccinated so he could fucking tour and shit. And he's the kind of like guy who's like, look at me. I'm not the fucking picture of health. Oh, no. He's got <laughs> he's the a one big form fat of dude. And yeah. he's, uh, he's a cigarette smoker from time to time. And he, he, he likes to eat good food. And he took the shot. He got the COVID. And he's still pretty concerned with his health. Um, As you should be if you're overweight. Most most definitely. And I mean, he's not just a little chubby. No. I mean, sorry, bud. I love you. But... I mean, he would be the first to admit that he's He would be overweight. the medical uh, body mass index chart of obese totally. probably twice over. Yeah. Um, Which is the number one comorbidity of deaths with COVID-19 in the United States. Uh, overweight and vitamin D deficiency. Here we go already, man. We're getting into it. Um I think this video is pretty much done. So this is three days ago. Okay. And if you if you had anything else you wanted to say, you could do that while I'm pulling this up. Well, all I'm going to say is that you got to think Australia is entering into spring and summer right now. So if they're going to these crazy lockdown measures and we are just now entering in the Northern Hemisphere into fall and winter, what are they going to bring here after? You know, governments look at other governments and what they're doing and they're going to think, oh, Look how effective what Australia was doing is over there. Let's go ahead and use that here during our winter. Seen the biggest COVID spike so far today. 390 infections with the Premier warning the upward trend will continue for days to come. Overnight in Sydney, there were two more deaths. One, a woman in her 40s who was found dead at her Cabramatta home. The other, a man in his late 90s, while 25 new cases in Dubbo is causing major concern for the health of unvaccinated Indigenous communities. Let's go live. Nobody, maybe with the exception of Canada, has been more horrible to their fucking Indigenous communities, and now they're placating them and exploiting their minority in this. Oh, yeah. That's not a word, is it? Minority in this. It's kind of what they're doing here with the African American community. Yeah. And you know what? Look at what's going on in New York City right now. They've introduced these, it's key to the city or some shit like that. Yeah. New York key. I don't remember how, but 60, the last time I checked, it was 60% of black Amer or black adults in New York City are unvaccinated. So what is happening here? We're having an apartheid state and a lot of minorities fall on the side of the non-vaccinated. So... What are you going to do? Once again, the minorities are going to be not able to access your basic necessities. Are we minority now? I don't know. Live now to state political reporter Alex Hart. Good afternoon to you, Alex. There are new suburbs on alert in Sydney today. Afternoon, Sally. Yes, the virus still causing major headaches in the city southwest, but Australian it is Anderson very much Cooper. a worsening situation in Western Sydney as well. Blacktown and Mount Druitt were singled out as suburbs of concern, both in the Blacktown Council area, which had 64 cases today. Canterbury Bankstown still had the most in greatest. So far, they've brought up two deaths in all the footage we've watched. Everything's about cases, just like yeah. what a lot of the pundits over here are saying, you know, people more leaning our way. This is a case dimmick. Yeah. Man, I've heard they're starting to fucking be pretty reckless with the going straight to intubation, to putting these people on ventilators, even though we learned the hard way that that was that. killing people more than it was saving them. He was in palliative care. Sydney, 74 cases. The state's total, and of course, the bulk, mostly in Greater Sydney, 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 390. A new record, I don't know if they talk seven about weeks more. into lockdown. And the situation in Western um, New South Wales care. is particularly worrying. More it didn't cases say anything. She died Morgan, in her home. Where the vaccination rate yeah. is very um, low so clearly in the vulnerable the indigenous right. community. Sadly, so the, the death toll has risen again too, as you mentioned. Another fully vaccinated victim, a man in his late 90s, who was in palliative care in Newcastle. And a woman in her 40s has died right. at home 16, in 17 months ago. He pointed it out on the uh, 
CIA funded JRE podcast. And sorry, Joe, just gotta flick shit sometimes when I see you doing certain things. Oh, he know. he's in the in the heat or in the hot seat again. By the way, for making another blunder. First, he was you know what did he say to Dave Smith? If a twenty one year old healthy yeah, kid yeah, comes up healthy. to you, so he was giving misguided info on uh, getting vaccinated. Dr. Fauci, Joe Biden, and John Oliver all fucking went after him. And then he had another guest on, and I don't know who it was. It wasn't anybody I was familiar with, but he goes off on the vaccine passports. I should just clarify, I'm totally joking. I don't think JRE is a CIA-funded podcast, but at at this point in time, I am fully convinced that he's a useful idiot, if nonetheless. I mean... Bob Lazar going on his podcast twice and then the little Tic Tac, the Fraber, Commander Fraber. Everything that you see in the mainstream news now oftentimes gets blown up on the podcast before. Yeah. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard, man, that's how she got onto the scene. Yeah. It just anybody that kind of gets big, oftentimes it starts with him. And are people paying to be on his show? You know, that's a good question on how it works because... Uh, one other reason I kind of lost a truckload of respect for him is after he signed the deal with him and then immediately take off 60 some odd episodes oh, right. of his Let's controversial Spotify. guests. Yeah. You can still find those on the old podcast apps, but they're not there. He's basically like, I don't care. Yeah. They're not actively censoring him at this point. How long is that going to be? And we don't know that they aren't. Right. He was not vaccinated. Health officials. Answered our question. 40, is that the 40-year-old? Officials are also deeply concerned about an outbreak. That fucking selfish bitch took up a hospital bed after not being vaccinated. Oh, wait, oh, wait she, she died wasn't in, in the home. hospital. So why the fuck are you talking about it? Like, she's some kind of strain on society. How dare you die? At the uh, Giant Steps Autism School in Gladesville, seven students, eight family members and three staff are infected. Let's hear from the Premier and the Health Minister speaking this morning about the worsening situation. It's horrible every time you talk about a death, Um, but that is what we need to prevent. We need to prevent people ending up in hospital and we need to prevent people dying. That's the government's for. That's why vaccines will help. Stopping the spread obviously helps, but um, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that that increasing case numbers is a horrible situation and not one we want to be in. The entire um, New South Wales Health Service is on high alert. I'm just going to get drunk and yell at the TV for the rest of this. And Alex, are harsher restrictions on the way across the state? They are, Sally. Crisis Cabinet is meeting this afternoon to sign off on new restrictions. That guy's eyes the don't of move. Public health orders. We're expecting much tighter rules to prevent people Rappel. leaving Sydney. People no longer allowed to visit a second residence unless it's an emergency. And the distance you can travel is likely to be reduced. The travel from your home, that is. Time limits also on exercise. More enforcement of masks wearing requirements. Police have had enough after seven weeks of people pushing the boundaries or flat out not complying. The Premier... They're just walking right by people without masks on. Take a look. Let's not pretend that people are doing the right thing. People are knowingly doing the wrong thing and pretending it's because they didn't understand. Any additional uh, measures that would help us enforce the health orders... They like that sound clip. They've Um, used it a few times. Frustrated at the moment. Despite the growing number of cases right across New South Wales, the health minister says there are no plans at the moment to put the whole state in lockdown. Sally. Okay, thank you very much. Wait a few days reporting there. for a couple more videos. Well, young people are becoming the focus of vaccination efforts in the race to meet immunisation targets. Paul Kadak is at the... CDC this week officially recommended pregnant women get vaccinated. Did you see that? No. I'm glad I didn't. It's crazy to me. I would. There's also trials going on right now in like ages uh, 11 to to 16. I think 16 is the current cutoff, or is it 12? 12. So maybe those were already just wrapping up, but they are doing fucking studies on newborns or trials on newborns, trials on toddlers. Who the fuck are these parents handing their kids over to this shit? They think that they. You know, they're the Karens of the world. I think they're doing the right thing. I'm so glad my name's not Karen. Olympic Park hub for us this afternoon. Paul, almost half of New South Wales adults have now had a first dose of the vaccination. 
Good afternoon, Sally. Yeah, that's right. The state. Why is it all these news guys look like their kids have a gun pointed to their head behind the camera? Five percent of people over the age of sixteen in New South Wales don't kill them. At least their first vaccination, and we have twenty-six percent of that population have now fully vaccinated with two shots. Mass and face shield. Five thousand people getting a shot yesterday. As the premier flagged, even some opportunities for relaxing some restrictions as early as next month today. The government says by the end of today, 15,000 year 12 students from COVID... They're just somebody whose job is to squirt fucking hand sanitizer on people. Hotspots will have had their jab from here at Kudos Bank Arena. Did you notice but that? But that does fall short of the 24,000 capacity that had been planned for, though there is another day of vaccinations here tomorrow. On Sunday, 10,000 vaccinations are being made available. By the way, if you ever want me to pause it, let me know. I don't want to be the only one. Who need Hang on. Those shots to Hang on. To Back it up. And Back it up. Back it up. <laughs> no, no, too much, too much, too much. Go on, keep going forward. Took too much, too much. Four, though there is another day okay, of so watch this. tomorrow. On Sunday, 10,000 vaccinations are being made Wait available for, for tradies oh. and construction workers. These guys don't give a fuck. LGA you know why? Because they've been working this whole ga work. goddamn time, and, and none of them have gotten sick. They've all got the chin diapers. Yeah. Who are authorized workers in those local government areas. Of You're noticing things I didn't notice. The growing number of cases being spread in essential workplaces. As the hotels industry confirms, it's been talking to the state I, government I watched all these about allowing like a the partial reopening to staff and customers who have been fully vaccinated. Oh, allow a partial opening to hotels. As long as it's safe to do so, it'll get our doors open, it'll get our staff back in employment. If you want to get down to your local pub, if you want to have a burger. I want to take health advice from a guy with no neck and a, f and a set of teeth like that. And a, and a schooner with, with mates, then uh, the, the solution is get vaccinated. What we want to, do, to achieve in September and October is uh, provide some uh, opportunities for people to have She's an extra so thing Brownish. that they can do, which they currently can't do today. Kate Brown but with I don't want to get the impression that it's going to be freedom <clears throat> all round. It's not going to be freedom all round. Licking his empty nut sack down there. Double doses. That's what the mills in here. Which on current predictions won't be until the end of October. But more urgently, 8,000 vaccine doses are being sent to the north of the state, including Walgett and surrounding areas, to try and protect vulnerable that communities. Fucking that fucking airport is empty. There. As WA this afternoon has announced proof of vaccination. This is like a is big area, dude. From anyone wanting to There's enter like that four state people from behind him. The tougher border restrictions will also require a recent negative test, as well as evidence of at least one shot of a COVID vaccine. Sally. Okay, thank you very much. Paul Caddock reporting mm, for us there. Time. Two new cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in the ACT on day one of a seven-day lockdown. Taylor Aiken is live in Canberra this afternoon. Taylor, Oh, the she's my favourite. Never mind. Over. Very much so, Sally. The ACT it's like if the, it's like the redneck end of the Australian of accent. This you just get kicked out but of here. The lockdown will only lift once none of those cases are <laughs> infectious in the community. One of these cases is a 14-year-old schoolboy, not linked to any of the existing cases in the cluster. The ACT apologising after people were turned away from testing sites, despite waiting up to seven hours. It's still not yet clear how COVID entered the capital with. Authorities investigating if patient zero, a man in his 20s, travelled illegally to Sydney in the days before he tested positive. But genome seek. This fucking shit has been around for, well, a year and a half. And they're like, how did it get here? He's not tied to anybody that had it. <sighs> Sequencing has confirmed he does have the Delta variant. We've just heard the Prime Minister holding an update following national... I thought they hadn't the isolated it, so yeah, how can so they Prime do now? They claim Scott they've Morrison isolated it in Italy the a while ago. Sydney, Melbourne, Never really and the ACT. read into it, but... Okay, this isn't direct, but this is somebody I know. Went to the doctor, got tested for COVID, and he said, if it comes back positive, is it going to be able... You could tell me if it's the Delta variant or not, and he says, we can't tell that now. Maybe Australia's ahead of us. I don't know. Saying that the genome, only way through this is say? through genome vaccination sequencing. and short, sharp lockdowns. Australia also hitting a new milestone. One in four of the eligible population is now fully vaccinated. Australians are charting that course. Australians are making that path ahead for our nation out of COVID-19 with every step they take uh, into those vaccination clinics. 
Dude, see, here's the thing. They act like this is something that can be eradicated. Right, and it's not. And never will be. It's like getting rid of the cold or the flu. This shit's probably here to stay. We were warned today's figures would be bad, but it's painfully clear we are nowhere near the peak of this crisis. The big new development. In the past hour, the entire state is now controlled by stay-at-home orders. A snap late call by the Premier August calling 14th. Delta a diabolical strain. As we look live Which would have been at a stunning lockdown like Sydney 13th, tonight, probably. some stark news. Residents in every single suburb now subject to new tighter rules. It comes... After 466 cases today, another alarming spike. Four more deaths, the youngest, a woman in her 40s, all leading to tough new radius restrictions right across Greater Sydney. You keep Along fucking beating that old horse to death. Anyone caught breaking the rules. Gladys Berejiklian says we're at war, but this is no longer just Sydney's fight. Shutting up shop for a surprise shut down. From Batemans Bay to Broken Hill, the front line in the battle against COVID is now statewide, as all of New South Wales, more than 8 million people, are ordered into lockdown. This is literally a war, and we've known we've been in a war for some time. The Premier didn't announce it this morning, the regional order coming this afternoon, after health authorities discovered cases in the growing Dubbo... Out Why is she wearing, like, a fucking shower curtain? I didn't notice that. <clears throat> it's not just enough that the bitch has a fucking mask and... Did I imagine it? Who are you talking about? It's this chick that's walking. There oh, she is. Yeah. She's got a mask, a face shield, and a shower curtain. Looks like something you wear when you're getting a haircut. Like ...had already started to spread across the state. The movement of people has been, has been quite significant in the regions. And we've got a number of spot fires... Does everybody across, in Australia have a double Today chin? Today is the most concerning day of the pandemic America's that we've seen exported. in New South Wales. After 466 new cases, as many as three quarters of them could have been out and about while infectious. Oh Four God. more people have died. This outbreak now claiming 43 I love lives. the graphic department of this fucking seven Oh yeah, they're doing daily. great. Police asked the government Four for tougher deaths. rules and got them. The New South Wales Police Force will launch Operation Stay at Home eyes. Sunday at midnight. The 10 kilometre travel limit for exercise or shopping now reduced to 5 kilometres for all. It's about 3 miles, right? 5, 5k? Yeah. Yep. All of Greater Sydney. Travelling to regional New South Wales now needing a permit. Travelling to a second home only allowed for work accommodation or urgent repairs. And or if in you're council rich. areas of concern, Obviously. you can no longer yeah, leave home for recreation, you have a home, only a exercise. And people must now register the person they include in their singles bubble. Not because it's been spread in cases, people they say. Now. Just to stop in the, in the state around. that took guns. It only takes a handful country. of people to do the wrong thing. Commissioner Fuller, the minister, myself, and our team have been in contact about what police need in relation to escalating their compliance efforts. Police promising more checkpoints on major highways with 500 ADF personnel Black? joining compliance efforts on there? Monday. The fines are some of the biggest fines that I've ever seen and we will be issuing them. Going from $1,000 to $5,000 for breaching self-isolation, lying on a permit, lying to a contact tracer. $3,000 for more than tracer, two people not a exercising. Cop. Younger, more mobile people making up the largest share of new cases. If we thought mall security guards were bad... These oh. people that dreamt about being cops, imagine these fucking contact tasters are just oh, fucking yeah. signing up for this shit. No More doubt. Half under the age of 30. Authorities say the COVID threat is shifting, with Again, infection we're talking about numbers cases, starting to stabilise in places like Fairfield and Canterbury Bankstown, but picking up elsewhere. The highest number of new cases yesterday was here in Cumberland Council. With 76 cases, 69 in Blacktown, 63 in Canterbury Bankstown, 59 in Penrith. With concerns about rising cases in Blacktown, Doonside, Mount Druitt, Marylands, Guildford. I want to cancel that town, by the way. I don't know what we can do. We try to stay safe Black as much town. as possible. In the regions, another 23 cases in Dubbo, 16 in the Hunter, with COVID detected in sewage in Broken Hill. Testing clinics again busy and at record You guys numbers. don't have enough to we do with this fucking pandemic. You gotta go start looking through shit. I'm buying that. Sounds fucking 
Legit. The delays in testing. Results now taking days, but rapid antigen testing is still at the trial stage to help workers in hotspot areas to isolate while waiting for results. Oh, a new three but it's in the trial stage. It's OK. Starts next week. We're seeing more people lose their businesses. We need these new measures to work. There is no perfect path forward. Are we going to make more mistakes? Of course we are. We're going to frustrate people. Of course we are. But it's a journey we take together. That's what she says okay, when she flicks the bean at night. Of course we are. To you. So just hours notice for this statewide lockdown. But the Dude, I just noticed no choice. these baby blue eyes that all these fucking news reporters yeah, have. Right. Except for that baby fuck. Blue eyes, huh? morning, but it is He's got blue eyes. He does, but, but they're not as like sharp Paul Newman type blue eyes like that last guy. Cases linked to the Dubbo outbreak already moving around the state. Okay, so you get a taste of August 14th. I wanted to visit Australia. I wish I did a long time ago. That's exactly what I was thinking when we were watching this and I'm just going there's no fucking way now okay one more short one too we'll Seven watch. News like to, likes to use the red there huh this is from yesterday August 15th in Australia yeah they, they use the same uh, psychology CNN as, as uh, like fast food joints and oh for all, sure all yellows and reds and loud colors and they always, you know, this new COVID-19 graphic. Um, by the way, I watched a video about doing screen presentations, and they said, do not use your mouse. I noticed that cupboard does. Yeah, why not? I, don't, I think whoever did this thinks they know what they're talking about, because I stopped watching it after he said that. It's probably for, like, schools It's or distracting. Like it's like, well, you've shown them where you're talking. All right, so, yeah, the COVID-19 graphic, though. It's just... It's updated. At first, it was just one. Now it's like a bunch of them. Oh yeah, we gotta be afraid. Gotta be afraid of. There's so many. Of them. It's coming. The streets have been particularly quiet today, even for a pandemic Sunday. PM. A sign, nice. perhaps, that maybe that deterrent effect is already kicking in. And tomorrow, even again, it will ramp up a level. It will be a different Sydney with 1,400 police officers and 500 soldiers, uh, ensuring not only compliance checks, but even manning roadblocks to ensure that that restriction is limited. Now, there are fears of overreach from authorities, and one family from here in Rydalmere tells us that is exactly what happened to them overnight when they were evicted from their home and sent into hotel quarantine. It is called a Section 62. Either you're getting out or you're going to get locked up. A health order enforced by police that evicted a COVID-positive family of four from their own Rydalmere home. We haven't breached nothing. We'll sit in at home. We will self-isolate in. The police and the health department, some of them, are operating like the Gestapo. Because, says the family's lawyer Paul McGurr, they were threatened with arrest based only on a suspicion of what they might do, then forced into hotel quarantine. Because of the way that <laughs> behaves, maybe risk to public health. Who said that, sorry? It was written here Minority on report. the formal order because the father has a criminal history, but no history of not complying with health orders. He Ironically, he is issues. being tracked anyway. And you know I've got an ankle on, and you know if I breach and leave, they can lock me up. The family chronicled their trip to Zetland, where the heavily pregnant and COVID-infected mother of two claimed to have been sick and urgent. Heavily pregnant. Not lately. She was happy, boy. That's a big bitch. Urgently needed a bathroom. She's pregnant. She needs to go to the bathroom. What do they want her to do? Go to the bathroom on the road? Is that what they want? They don't care about their pregnant women. <laughs> it's like a movie. It's, it's something you see in a movie. It's not something you'll see, you know, here at home. In this outbreak, a Section 62 is not uncommon. Our public health um, clinicians have been applying good common sense and judgment and we would never use that tool inappropriately but i can't comment on the specific circumstances but if doctors are making the rules here what's what what's what else is there to come here no way should the health officials be guessing or speculating on what somebody may or may not do Bearing in mind, they never even have met my clients. The dynamics of this outbreak change day to day, and because of that, the rules are changing with it, blurring the lines more than ever between the rights of individual versus society. Police there are learning go. what they can and At can't least they do. were a little blunt so with that. Across 24 hours, police issued 529 fines for breaches of the public health order, 
29 are now charged. From midnight, 1,400 police and 500 soldiers enforce harsher restrictions and harsher fines for breaching them. Across Greater Sydney, no leaving home unless for essential work, essential shopping, medical care, COVID testing, vaccinations or exercise and recreation. For those in the 12 hot zone LGAs, not even recreation is allowed. Everywhere, residents are confined within their local government area or five kilometres from their door if they cross into another. So now, if you live more than five kilometres from the beach, no more of this for now. Robert Avadia, 7 News. Pan back. Uh, that's what's going on in Australia, and uh, keep your eye on it, conspiracy players, because it's, it's by the day just getting worse. They're slowly just grabbing more and more power. This scares the shit out of me. Oh, yeah, and it should. And I don't like that it scares us. I don't want to be scared. You know, you're not supposed to be fearful because that's what they want. They want fear. Well, I'm not going to duck in a corner because I'm going to try to blast it out and get people to pay attention to it because this isn't just... This is happening in our country on a small scale in New York City and certain parts of California. Um... San Francisco's starting to do some weird fucking shit. We in this country already have areas that are using vaccine passports. They can call it the key to the city. They can call it a fucking 10 minute long orgasm. It doesn't change what the fuck it is. It's show me your fucking papers. And I want to actually... Prove that you're compliant with getting a non-approved rushed vaccine that doesn't fit the freaking uh definition of a vaccine in three four years ago as per usual the biggest fucking pussies in the world always leave the way we're gonna close this episode thanks for watching ladies and gentlemen we're gonna close with a video unless you have anything you want to say before i start it no uh sorry i do know and love one person that lives in australia and I hope she moves. I hope she and her wife decide to come here, where at least this won't be starting for a little while. That's France, August 10th. Good night. Peace.